Oh, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. There we go. Welcome to our, our final Becoming Byzantine webinar. Uh, we've made it all the way through Christ our Pascha. Uh, what a wonderful journey it's been. Hopefully this has been very instructional for you all, and we're so glad that you've made it through this uh, this series of webinars. Uh, we can't do it without you, so it's great to be with you all again. And as we begin our final leg of going through the catechism, uh, Father Daniel, if you would lead us in a prayer. I sure will. Blessed is our God always now and ever and forever. Amen. This is an Ambon prayer. It was actually uh, composed by Father David Petrus um, for September 1st, the new year, so the beginning of our our Byzantine liturgical calendar. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, who make all things new, that you have brought us to this beginning of a new year in your merciful loving kindness. Bless the year with goodness. Receive the petitions of us sinners as we pray for salvation and grant your abundance to the earth. Keep unharmed the environment that clothes the earth and through which by your will, we who inhabit earth live and move and have our being so that we, your unworthy suppliant, suppliants, may be delivered from destruction and ruin. Strengthen us in the observance of your commandments, loving you with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and our neighbor as ourselves. Make this a year of your favor, giving alms to the poor, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing to the naked, and homes to the homeless, visiting those who are sick and in prison. Grant this, grant this through the prayers of your most pure mother, the all-holy Theotokos, and the venerable Father Simeon, for you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, and we glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Perfect yeah. for our new liturgical year. Yes, for our topic today. A lot Absolute. of, a lot of things that resonate there. So Yes. Welcome again uh, to get through a couple of introductions and announcements just as we uh, we are waiting for Father Michael Wynn. He will be joining us, um, who has been a great addition to this Becoming Byzantine team, um, specifically because he's so knowledgeable with the catechism, because he's the English language editor. So we sh we will see Father Michael uh, shortly. He got caught behind some computer updates. So, you know, the, the technology demons are, are real, uh, but he is coming. And of course, we're very happy to have with us, as always, Father Daniel Dozier, who's uh, you know, kind of the uh, the founder of this initiative, the Becoming Byzantine series and in ministry development. So good to see you again, Father Daniel. Good to see you too. And Thank it was you. and it was great to spend the, that pilgrimage weekend with you up at your really really beautiful time. So what a blessing! Yeah, it was the Becoming Byzantine Brotherhood. We, we have we have to get everybody out together at some point. Absolutely, Lord willing. And Father Deacon Anthony Dragani, good to see you again. Hi, Robert. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, and my lowly self, Robert Klesko, uh, kind of taking you through uh, this last section of the catechism. It's great to be kind of in the driver's seat and directing our our conversation. It's uh, it's been a blessing to me as well to be with with this great team assembled here. Um, and just a couple of reminders: this series is co-sponsored by the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix and Vineyard of the Lord Catholic Ministries. And of course, we're very happy, we announced this in our last webinar, to have the sponsorship of the Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky Institute. So we're really grateful to them uh, to be a sponsor of this series and kind of continuing our work forward uh, and making more and more things possible. But of course, as always, we can't be without our wonderful viewers, um, those who support us by watching, those who spread our, our videos on social media and keep the word going. Um, so if you feel so inclined as we enter into the church's new year to make a uh, donation to this good work, I'm going to post a link there to Father Daniel's page, which has a giving section. And right down there on the bottom left of the screen, there is a way to donate to the Becoming Byzantine series. It really helps us out um, to, to keep things going, to keep this program expanding. So thank you very much in advance for your generosity. And another wonderful thing that you can do to help us and support us is exactly what I just said, to spread the videos on uh, social media, spread to your friends and family. Uh, if you go to our YouTube page, which I'm posting there in the link, oh, I need to do it to everyone. I will do 
like and subscribe our videos. That helps with the algorithm. It helps get our videos to the top of the search. Um, so that is very, very much appreciated because the more people like and subscribe and spread the good news around, the more people get touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is exactly what we're trying to do in this series. So thank you very much for your support over these past 12 months. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride. So as we open uh, this last section of the catechism, this is paragraph numbers 911 to 1001. So this is the life of the church, society, and the universe transfigured in the church. So a really important topic. Um, we will be getting back to a couple of things that we left off on the last webinar, um, especially we wanted to cover the of euthanasia. Uh, that's a question we're going to we're going to ask Father Michael as he joins us, uh, because unfortunately his country, Canada, is being born in the United States, but we're going quickly there. So I wanted to get his perspective, but I wanted to start, and this is kind of uh, a way to frame our discussion from last time when we talked about those offenses against the dignity of the human person, which is a very very important topic um, as our culture continues down a variety of, of evil roads which continue to disrespect the dignity of the person especially the person made in the image and likeness of god what i wanted to start and this is father daniel father deacon anthony feel free uh whatever the spirit prompts you to respond but i was wondering if there's a particular eastern contribution um that our church can make to that discussion on the dignity of the human person uh, much of that theology um uh, came down to us St. John Paul II, that was kind of his motto, is the dignity of the person. But I was wondering if, if there's anything on your heart about a particularly Eastern country dignity of the human. Either one to start. I'll, I'll go. Go ahead. I'll start. So um, this is not something that's exclusive to the East, but it is an emphasis of the East, is theosis, you know, divinization idea that every person is called to share in God's supernatural life and to become more and more like God. And that that emphasis on what we're called to be, um, what we're heading towards, hopefully, it really elevates human beings. You know, it elevates us, it shows our potential, and it explains you know, why there's something special about human life, why human life is sacred in a way that animal life, for example, or plant life is not. Um, so I think that's that's a key thing. You know, our emphasis upon what humans are called to be really bolsters our appreciation and understanding of the dignity of every human person. So I think that perhaps is the is the Eastern contribution in a sense. Yeah, and I one of the things I was thinking of was this uh, was Psalm eight five five through eight. Um, actually, if we start with verse three, it's, it's this beautiful reflection of this. It says. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him little less than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And uh, I was thinking about, you know, this this verse, which is really a reflection on on uh, the first couple chapters in Genesis regarding the human vocation. You know, what is our vocation as the imago Dei, as the image of God, which certainly is uh, a, an aspect, uh, a, ref a reflection or it is reflected in our our understanding of theosis and what our calling is. Um, there are a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting to think about. First of all. In the ancient Near Eastern world, um, the last act of a deity before inhabiting a temple that was being constructed was to erect an image uh, or to, to bless and consecrate an image of the deity. Uh, and that image of the deity was a representative or a representation of the, the dominion of that deity within the confines of the temple or within that realm uh, where, where the temple uh, was established, and so if we look at the, if we look at the first couple chapters of Genesis, what do we see the Lord God doing? Well, we see Him 
you know, erecting the rooms of a temple, establishing the rulers of those rooms. And then the last act is to establish man and woman as the image and likeness within the temple. And then on the seventh day, the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, what does God do? Well, he, uh, he is enthroned over the heavens and the earth. And so humanity in that sense really functions as an image of the deity and uh, that's meant to represent um, all the virtues, uh, all the, uh, the, the vocation uh, that God has in relationship to be an advocate, to function in a priest, in a priestly way, uh, to be co-regents really over creation, to exercise that co-regency over creation. And so from a, from a Christian standpoint, obviously in, in a Judeo-Christian, you could say, standpoint, we look at that and we say, this is what we point to when we want to understand what our dignity is in relationship with, uh, with the rest of creation, that we are slightly lower than the angels, we've been set above the other creatures, and yet that dominion that we exercise as a, as a form of co-regency with God is really reflective of, of being crowned with glory and honor uh, in service to the rest of creation. And so uh, what that means is that we have, we have something that can't simply be stripped away uh, based upon utilitarian uh, concerns. You know, we have a dignity uh, in, in the fact that we are created with an immortal soul. All the things we talked about in the first um, sections of the catechism, all these things I think really affirm uh, the unique, unrepeatable, uh, distinctive aspect of the human person. And that fact that we're called in to, to represent uh, God to the rest of creation, but then also to be formed in his likeness, uh, to grow in holiness. I think that that speaks to what our, our true vocation is. Um, and, and it's one of the ones, one of the things that I, you could see as Father Deacon Anthony said, across East and West. We were talking about offenses against the dignity of the human person and that topic of euthanasia um, mm -hmm. in that last section of the catechism. Um, I know Canada is is ahead of that evil game um, and the United States is, is slightly behind. So, Father Michael, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, really how how pastorally can you know what pastoral advice, especially in regard to euthanasia? Uh, can you give us stateside to to stem stem that the tide of that evil because it's coming, um, and the work of the church is to 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 fight against that. So uh, maybe tell us a little bit about what's going on in your country and uh, strategy to turn back that that evil tide. Sure. So I, I um, in Canada, euthanasia was made legal in 2016. And um, they just released, just um, not quite a month ago, they released the statistics uh, to 2021, the end of last December here in Canada. Um, when, when Canada was considering uh, establishing euthanasia as something legal, um, there, was a, there was a backlash uh, and saying, and one of the major things was, oh, it's a slippery slope. You'll, you have to have... Uh, you know, you can make a request, it has to go through a panel, it has to go through another panel, it takes time and so forth. And we were all concerned that there'd be a slippery slope and so forth. Now, uh, five years in, five years later, you can ask for euthanasia and have it done that day, believe it or not. That with, with like, if you ask in the morning, it can be done by the evening. Um, and within a five year period, uh, it has increased not by 30%, not by 100%, not by 200%, not 500%, but 888% in five years uh, across Canada. And uh, it, how, how bad is it? Uh, well, um, there is a 12-year-old boy in British Columbia who is ill, and he doesn't know what... The doctors don't know what's wrong with him. And the hospitals offered him euthanasia already. Um, and just last week, it was reported here that a veteran that had fought within the Afghanistan uh, conflicts for Canada uh, had um, 
phoned for a helpline, like because he was going through some PTSD, depression, and so forth, and he was offered euthanasia on the phone. Uh, and so th this is the extent of it is here in Canada. Um, why? Why is this happening in Canada? Because we're we're getting we're getting away from our Christian roots as a nation. It, it, it was founded as a Christian as a Christian nation, both Catholic and, and Protestant, um, uh, throughout Canada. Uh, the states more Protestant than Catholic, I think, in its uh, history. Um, and uh, it's really getting away from from the human being being the most important thing in our life. Uh, this is a father, Father uh, Daniel. You mentioned this just as I was coming online about uh, everything that's in the part one of the catechism. You know, just look, look at look at the dignity of the human person and everything. And this is what I think has been uh, more and more uh, we'll moved away from within Canadian society. Uh, we we like to become very comfortable. We like to one. Uh, get our desires as quickly as possible. We, we have a chain of coffee chain here called Tim Hortons. So we get our Timmies. We want our Timmies. We order our Timmies and we want it within 30 seconds. Paid, hot, piping hot, and off we go, right? And uh, so that's one. Um, and we're willing to let go of a lot of things in order to accommodate that type of uh, luxury. It's not a leisure, it's a luxury. And um, so, so what's happened is that while we are, and this will get into some other things later, uh, while we are a democratic country, more and more that democracy is giving way to, um, I'll call it a type of socialism, uh, where the human person is no longer regarded uh, with, with dignity, but seen as something that can be manipulated, as the catechism says, something that can be manipulated and uh, made a a consumer a consumable item i guess is the word i'm looking for it, it's just a constant selling of the human person to certain things and moving them around and so forth and um, this is what's happening within our medical system here uh, is that um, it's euthanasia is now offered simply as like what well, do you want us to fix it or do you want to die your choice and that, that's the state of it so the focus is upon the, the dignity of the human person. We need to really focus on that and, and to understand that the, the dignity of the human person is not because something it's something that it's not something that we give to it, but it's something that's inherent within the human person because there is a creator uh, of which of whom we are made in his image and likeness. So that's the short answer. We could go on for a long time. I really invite our, our, our listeners, our viewers, to the Euthanasia Prevention um, Coalition here in Canada. Um, and uh, Alex uh, Schangenberg has done a lot of work in this area. And uh, also with um, a guy named Kevin Dunn. He's uh, got a wonderful uh, documentary called Fatal Flaws. And uh, it, it takes a look at the euthanasia laws here, not only in Canada, but here in the Netherlands and so forth. Father, can you, uh, can you post a link in the chat? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to do that on the phone. I'll try to do that. Oh, you're on your phone, there. okay. Well, well, the next question is being answered. I'll do the, my best on that, okay? Good. Thank you very much, Father Michael. Um, makes me sick and angry all at the same time. Um, mm. You know, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking, you know, here we are um, as and, and lay faithful. Um, it's, the, it's been the church's role from antiquity to care for the sick and to help those who are wounded. Um, and here we are with kind of this, this demon of, of euthanasia at the doorstep, taking all those people away whom the church can help um, and who the church ought to help. Um, it's very, very sad. Um, well, you know, so, sir, we, I was gonna say, Robert, one, one thing that's noteworthy yeah. about this, that, that exponential increase in, in rates of euthanasia it's 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 noteworthy, I think, because if you look at the trends in the Netherlands, and they've been experiencing, they have experience with this, what, 30, 40 years of, of active uh, euthanasia, it, the, the, the so-called right to die in most of these societies quickly turns into the duty to die. 
and and there there is sort of a perverse incentive built into especially socialistic systems of medicine to to push for that as a cost savings measure uh, because once once you go from the right to die to the duty to die it becomes a question of the high cost of keeping somebody alive and uh, and how do we manage costs and it's it's really tragic uh, to to see the the victims of this whole system where the, the people are pushing this um, and the same thing happens and has happened for decades in the Netherlands. We have we have test cases to see, and I'm I'm just so tragic to see it unfolding in Canada. Yeah, there's even uh, there's even a um, funeral uh, funeral home that has opened up a room for euthanasia and assisted suicide. Oh. Yes. So now we talked about back in 2016 about death centers opening. You know, but uh, when, when you don't deal with death properly and you keep calling it a, um, a celebration of life and, and ignoring death as that moment of, of uh, crossing the threshold into the presence of God, uh, you're, you're going to, you want to ignore it and you'll just see, oh, we can, hasten, we can hasten death when we want to it. And we can make it as comfortable and as pleasing and as comical and as a delight as possible, you know. And um, yeah, so that's a it's a it's a it's a it's a bad it's a bad scar on Canada, um, but that's that's just a symptom of where Canada is, in my opinion, where where we're heading at this very moment. Yeah. So yeah. So very sad. Well. We the, we the faithful, a lot, lot to pray for. Thank you, Father Michael. All right, uh, to move on to some new material, but certainly related. Um, this section of the catechism we're covering today um, talks about the church's role in transfiguring society. Mm. So I wanted to talk to uh, Father Deacon Anthony. In our spirituality in the East, um, we talk a lot about spurning the world or hating the world, right? Um, and that's kind of a, a spiritual approach to detachment. But yet the catechism talks about the church transfiguring the world. So how do these two seemingly opposite things go together? And how can we live that out in our Christian life? Yeah, so this only makes sense if we realize that the world was created good. That's the key thing. And, you know, other traditions like the Gnosticism and whatnot saw the world as inherently evil. Where Christianity always saw the world, all material things as inherently good because they were made by God. And God made them with a purpose, just as we are called to be divinized and to be perfected and become godlike beings. The world is called to something greater as well. It's called to enter a state that's completely you know, filled and transformed by the presence of God. But the world is corrupted right now. That's the problem. The world is corrupted. Uh, human beings you know, we're given dominion over the world. And when we fell, we brought the world with us. So the material world, although it's inherently good, is in a corrupted state. The good is still there, but there's a lot of things about it that are fallen. And when our spirituality talks about, you know, avoiding things of the world, it's talking about those corrupted things, those things that are in the fallen state, because ultimately they can hold us back, you know, from our ultimate goal, which is to be divinized, you know, theosis, um, become more and more like God. However, ultimately, the goal is for the world and us to reach our full potential. So where do we fit into all of this? Well, we as Christians, as we pursue our journey of theosis, are called to be a leaven in the world. You know, Christ or Pascha talks about how we are to be a leaven in the world. You know, our presence as Christians, as people infused, you know, with the presence of God within us, is meant to help take the world to where it belongs, which is a transfigured state. So that's how, that's how that's reconciled. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I, I'm reminded of the the famous quote by Saint of "Acquire the spirit of peace, and a thousand souls around you will be saved." Right. That's that transformation. It starts with us. You know, we as individuals are transformed as we grow in theosis, and we bring people with us, and that's that transformation. That's that trend. So. 
Thank you very much, Father Deacon. That was a that, that applies to so much in life as well. Uh, things like evangel, you know, evangelization, for example. Yeah. I remember years ago I was reading all these books on evangelization, different strategies, different techniques. But then somebody told me something that made a huge difference, which is, if you want to evangelize, focus on yourself and becoming holy. And that really makes a huge difference. We yeah. we lose perspective. So when we change ourselves, we change everything around us. Amen. Amen. Lord, make it so. Thank you. All right, Father Daniel, um, there's a long section in the Catechism, 918 through 926, that talks about all these principles from Catholic social teaching. Uh, so things like the common good, uh, development of civil society, solidarity, subsidiarity, all those kind of big fancy words in, in Catholic social teaching um, that as I read through them, I thought, you know, as our society is becoming more and more fractured, how is it that we as church, what are some pastoral strategies? So pick one of those principles of Catholic social teaching. Um, you know, how can we kind of reinvigorate the meaning of these principles and put yeah. them into practice for positive change? Yeah, it's uh, it's a terrific question. And I, and I kind of want to build off of what Father Deacon Anthony was saying about this idea of 11. You know, what what is the church but 11 of the kingdom of God? And if we think about, you know, we we have this view of the church and the world as though they're sort of two separate entities, when in fact, you know, the, the church is that leaven of the new creation of, of this embodiment of the kingdom of God that is advancing um, our, our transfiguration into the likeness of God. And so the way the catechism frames these discussions of you know, Catholic social principles, um, I think it it sees the church and, and it treats the church, I think quite rightly, as the means aspirationally uh, that, that by which we model these principles. So all the things you've just talked about, the common good, you know, development of civil society, solidarity, so subsidiarity. So I just want to start there because I think it's important to say that, you know, these these teachings are not just simply things that apply out there are things that apply in the world um, that have no bearing on the church. The church should be the embodiment of these things. So one example to your, to your question, the common good, you know, uh, and uh, I think, again, Father Deacon Anthony touched on this when he talks about the realization of our potential um, as, as human beings. So the common good, really, the catechism talks about sort of two dimensions of the common good. It's the uniqueness of the human person, you know, as a person in communion, as as a, you know, this idea of sort of this radical, uh, atomistic um, individualism that that defines so much of society, is is obviously not the answer. Um, and uh, at the same time, we don't want to just sort of lose ourselves in in the collectivism, which is something that's a, that's addressed in another core principle. But the fact that we are created as unique and unrepeatable as a human person in communion with other persons. <clears throat> and so that uniqueness needs to be developed, needs to flourish. Uh, and we, we have that capacity for growth and development. This is, this, is the, um, this is the way of achieving a common good in society where individuals, as well as the, the group, uh, can continue to grow and advance without reducing uh, one or absorbing uh, one into the other. And that's that's an important part of the church's mission to transfigure society. <clears throat> so it, it's it's a key moral principle in, in terms of advocating for the common good. Uh, boy, it's hard not to touch on these other things, but I know we, we, we want to be in, in the interest of time. I, I think the common good in the church is expressed most especially um, if we go back to the heart of what the church is about. It's about um, you know our our worship. It's about our faith. It's about our mission. Um, it's about growth in in spirituality. Uh, it's about uh, growing in our knowledge and understanding of of who God is. But then most importantly, it's about our transfiguration to the likeness of God. So so the church in focusing putting its focus there and not on these other things. I think helps to contribute to the common good because what does it do? It creates citizens 
who, you know, as, as it talks about in civil society, you know, we, we are good law-abiding citizens uh, who honor the law, um, the authentic law, the law that is, is in accord with natural law and in, a, in, a, in accord with divine law. Uh, we become those productive, uh, fruitful citizens that really become that leaven in society, transforming it within a, a Christian worldview. So I'll pause there, but I think I think by focusing in on the common good um, and not just seeing, uh, you know, a bunch of competing interests vying for power uh, in the church, I think, I think that's, um, that's, for instance, where this whole synodality thing could go if it's, if it's done well. You know, Catholic social teaching is a, it's a big theological topic, um, and especially in regard to kind of applying it to our modern situation, it's, it's quite complicated. So I appreciate that that answer, Father Daniel. Um, Father Michael, um, as we kind of go through another very, very kind of, uh, especially now, kind of controversial topic that uh, as we become more collectivist in our <laughs> in our out in our kind of outlook as a culture, um, something like private property and the right to private property, uh, people don't understand and they don't appreciate. So why does the church insist on that right to private property? And, and what does it mean theologically? It, well, yeah, there's, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, when I, when I, when you uh, asked that question, I thought immediately of the, of um, that video from the World Economic Forum, <laughs> which says that you will, in the future, I mean, they're making proposals, right? In the future, you will own nothing and you will like it. And I remember uh, hearing those words and watching them on that video, the screen, and kind of going, that is so antithetical to Christianity. Um, and uh, this is, um, this is uh, again, uh, where it, it, it's rooted in what I spoke about earlier and what Father both fathers, uh, Dan, Daniel and Anthony, has spoken about has to do with um, what it means to be made in God's image and likeness, right? The dignity and, and all that's resulting about it. Um, I, I want to go first to where we're made each of us in God's image and likeness. But again, we belong to a community. It's just like in the Holy Trinity. There's a father, a son, and the Holy Spirit, but they live in a community together. They don't exist uh, on their own, and 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 as such, we don't exist on our own, being made in His image and likeness. Within, it, but we need, um, un, unlike God, who is uh, un, who is uncreated. We're created, and we're created in time and space. I'm, I'm going to, uh, and again, we we need an, an a place, an area, in order for that growth to take place. And so we find ourselves in a community of people, but we also find ourselves in, in a, a place whereby pr private property is important. Not that everyone has their own property. I don't own any property except the square foot in Scotland. You can call me Lord because of that. Um, but um, uh, I don't own any property. Like I don't own a house or anything like that. Um, and because, uh, but, but we have the opportunity for that because it allows me uh, uh, a chance to exercise the mercy that God has bestowed upon me with others with the things that I have. If I don't own anything, then I have nothing to share with someone, right? So it's it's actually, I, I would say it's, it would be kind of a, um, taking a bit of paradise with us the, through th from from the fall, that the Lord has still provided us an opportunity in time and space to be able to to say, you know, ultimately, you know, this microphone, it's it's Michael's, but ultimately it's the Lord's because I can't use this without breathing. And the Lord's the one who gives me the breath to be able to do that, right? And so, um, but I'm able to to share, I'm, I'm using a microphone, but you know, I have bread, I have wine, I can share that with other people in order to benefit and allow God's mercy to flow through me to others. That's a very short answer. But it's a right within Christianity because we need to have that opportunity to show mercy and love unto others that we've been given so graciously by the Lord. Yeah. 
Very good. Yeah, as you were speaking, I kept thinking about Genesis and our, our stewardship over creation. You can't learn how to be a steward unless you have something to steward. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can't do it. Um, yeah. So that I think that's that's where that that right to private property comes comes in. So it's it's that we're trying to recover what we had lost in in the garden, but you need something to take care of. So thank you, Father Michael. Thank you, uh, Father Deacon Anthony. Uh, again, another kind of controversial subject. We live in a culture that seems to be getting further and further from. Uh, Judeo-Christian values. I mean, that much is is very, very clear. Um, and the people who are moving us away from Judeo-Christian values um, might not see the reason why, why would we want to live in a moral society anyway? Um, why not just be this, you know, these radical individuals kind of fighting for any scraps from the table that we can get? Why would I get along with my neighbor? Why, why be moral in our culture and society? Yeah, so as you said, you know, Christianity has been at the center of morality in the West for quite a long time. When we move further away from that, it opens up a lot of problems. So how has how was Christian morality at the center of Western morality? Well, it comes down to this. What we discussed earlier, the value, the dignity of the human person. We talked about the potential of human beings in theosis and how every human being is made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore every human being deserves certain rights. Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, you know, one of the foundational documents of the United States, it says that all human beings are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, the first of which is the right to life. Mm -hmm. So we can even see there in, in the formation of this particular country that God and Christian understanding of the human person really became the foundation for the government. You know, our rights under law are defined by our dignity as given by God. It's an inalienable right from our creator. Um, the problem is when we move away from that, that's when things happen. That's when human beings are no longer seen as values, as, as beings of value, beings of inestimable worth, but rather we're seen as cogs in a machine. We're seen as consumers or producers, or we're seen as assets or liabilities. And that leads to things like uh, the horrible situation that Father Michael talked about. For example, a 12-year-old with a mystery ailment being encouraged to have doctor-assisted suicide. Um, that's where this leads. Once we remove ourselves from understanding that every human being is of tremendous worth, has the right to life from God, once we remove ourselves from that, we end up with horrible, horrible situations where human beings are reduced to something functional and something ultimately disposable. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. The sooner we kind of get away from a society rooted in human dignity and value, um, the, the, the more quickly we arrive at chaos, right? Yeah. If we don't root our society in morality and especially Judeo-Christian values, um, you get this dog eat dog society um, where you know your your obligation to your neighbor is to devour them, um, and that's scary, scary stuff, scary stuff. Um, Father Daniel, yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about this in light of, you know, the issue is is not even explicitly religious; it's it's philosophical, yeah. right? It's yeah. it's empiricism; it's it's the empiricism of human Locke. Uh, essentially reducing the person to just the sum of their experiences. And what that does, it, it, it has this sort of appeal. It's like the apple. <laughs> it's like, well, you can become whatever you want to be. But ultimately what it does, kind of to Father Deacon Anthony's point, is it, it's, it makes you subject to the, to, the, to the powers of the state or the marketplace because because it's all about pleasure and pain has nothing to do with intrinsic value it has nothing to you know this the whole loss of personalism you know the, having an immortal soul you know being in the image and likeness of god uh being a a, a body soul unity um and and not just 
subject to uh, the, the whims of experience that where, there, where there's no you, you, there's no you there, right? There's no you there. Uh, I was listening to a TED talk talking about that. You know, there, there is no you there. It's, it's just, you know, you just are the sum of your experiences. And, and then I was trying to inspire youth by, by giving and hearing this talk, but it's just so deadly. <laughs> it just, I mean, if you deny personhood, uh, you end up with an 880% increase in, in euthanasia because then what's to say that the state can't say, well, you know, we, we can impose on you. Anyway, I was just, it was just kind of a, a, a thought I had, but. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And along that thread of thought and kind of another scary, um, oh, another scary practice of our modern culture is, which I thought the catechism did a great job addressing is that sin of calumny. Yeah. Um, we live in a culture that loves to cancel people. Right? Sorry about that. That's <laughs> all right, Father Michael. Um, so that whole kind of phenomenon of canceling people, besmirching someone's good name at all costs, mm -hmm. their political opponent or their uh, celebrity that you need to take down a few pegs. I mean, our culture, especially our media, loves to do that. They thrive on canceling people and jumping yeah. on somebody's mistakes, whether it's a true accusation or not. <clears throat> so why is calumny such a terrible sin? And why is it so rampant in our culture, do you think, Father Daniel? Oh, uh, so I, I mean, I think the two great temptations of the age are uh, calumny and detraction, right? So, so what, what's the difference? We sometimes use them as though they're, they're synonym, synonyms. Uh, when we're revealing the hidden th faults of another uh, so that their, their good name, their reputation is, is seriously damaged, it's called detraction right that's detraction um when we are are telling lies uh about others that's known as calumny and i think both are problems and you see them especially on social media uh even among so-called faithful catholic christians um where where detraction it's as though you know you, you suspend the moral laws of the universe by posting sort of gotcha moments online of, of people, uh, you know, revealing or disclosing things. And, and it's the, uh, it's the clickbait, right? It's what gets you click clicks. Uh, and uh, it, it, it garners a lot of interest. It's very self-affirming, you know, when you put something on there about that, uh, that, that perhaps is, is true, uh, but destroys the good name uh, of an individual. And, uh, and so as a result, you know, they, they've lost their good name, they aren't able to function as well in society, they may lose their job, they may lose their vocation, there's a lot of things that can happen. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, things shouldn't be disclosed. Certainly, we know, like, for instance, with the clergy abuse crisis, there are things that need to be exposed. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is this aspect of, of kind of a, a, the self-affirming yeah, I'm going to uh, pull the veil back on on someone's life, even if they've, you know, if if it was a long time ago or whatever it happens to be, and it it becomes a uh, it, it destroys their good name. So this is one of the attacks on the person, just as uh, to attack property, you know, the the idea of upholding the dignity of the human person by protecting their freedom and their property. Uh, you know that that's that's one of the ways that we we see uh, uh, the the need to protect the person. Protecting their good name is the same, and everybody has a right to their good name. And so we need to really avoid these these sins of calumny and detraction because, in the end, what it does is uh, it's it's like murdering the name uh, of of another uh, for our own um self-aggrandizement so that's that's what i would say it's just to add if you don't mind uh father just thought it got me thinking about how so many of the uh attacks of the cancel culture are upon the person rather than the actual material or the thought or the idea that is being discussed right i don't 
I don't like the way you, I don't like that thought. So you are canceled instead of actually engaging in a, a dialogue uh, like that. So I just, I think it's important that we recognize that well, many of us do it in the church. Even we've picked up on society and, you know, um, it's a temptation to everyone, monk, lay person, clergy, there are whole oh. websites and periodicals dedicated to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it reminds me so much of our, our Eastern spiritual tradition about um, those warnings against engaging in vain curiosity, mm. right? which can mm -hmm. be so easily done online, especially in social media, where you, you fall down those rabbit holes of seeing something that's enticing, that's negative about someone else, and you follow it, and you follow it, and you follow it. And it makes you feel better about, you know, it's it's that prayer of the Pharisee, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, I thank you for not making me like these other people. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, uh, guys. Um, you know, you know, when uh, there's been all sorts of studies about when, when people get engaged with pornography online, it's a dopamine release that they, they become addicted to this and they just go through the cycle, any of, like any other addiction. I'm wondering if there's a, dopamine hit or some other thing when this sort of thing happens with calumny detraction cancel culture and so forth armchair judge and jury you yeah, know yeah. Uh, i'm wondering if there if there is not only with the matters of the heart but i think i'm wondering if there's also a uh you know something that's going on in the brain as well like in that in that like that sort of effect i, I don't know so we're gonna ask one of my doctor friends yeah. <laughs> I think you're probably right. By the yeah. beginning. That, that makes sense. I, I think it's especially uh, true when, for example, you know how there's a th certain thrill when you win a sporting event, or mm -hmm. when your team wins something, or your political party wins a big election, mm -hmm. you get a rush, you get a thrill. Uh, I imagine there's a dopamine hit from something like that. In a similar way, when you see somebody that you perceive as the other, like a member of the opposite political viewpoint, or a member of the opposite team, and they have a big downfall, perhaps your brain interprets it as a victory in some twisted way. And that gives the hit. It, this reminds me though, of this, of this phrase, and maybe, you know, the saint, I think it's a Western saint, but there was a saint that was known to never say anything bad about anyone. And so she was asked, so what about the devil? Is there something that you could say about the devil? And, uh, you know, to kind of test her, uh resolved not to say anything bad about anybody and she thought for a moment and she said well he's a very hard worker Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the wonderful humor of the saints that's right <laughs> much better much better than detraction and, and calumny so, so thank you for that father daniel oh lord have mercy let's talk about something positive let's talk about education um, the Catechism does a, a beautiful job talking about uh, a parent's role uh, as the primary educators of their children. Uh, in fact, my, my pastor had uh, mentioned that phrase today in his homily, that parents are the primary educators of their children. Um, it's a phrase we hear a lot, but what does it mean beyond the, you know, the parents are the first ones to provide an education, but what... What is that vocation as part of parenthood to be an educator? So this is a question for anybody. What does it mean? Well, it's it's. Uh, I think it's to to shape the heart and mind and and uh, to 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 disciple uh, your your children uh, to 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 fulfill their vocation uh, to achieve their full potential in Christ. Um, so at a uh, you know, a very human level, but also at a, yeah, in a professional level, and then also at a, at a spiritual level. So all those dimensions, I think, are within the purview of the formative environment of the home. Now, whether or not children remain faithful to that is, is, is another question. But, uh, you know, that is that that is the obligation of the, of the parents to be able to provide that um, and to, uh, it's, it's also, you know, uh, an aspect of spiritual fathering and spiritual mothering, um, uh, to help train the heart and mind of a child. So that, that'd be my initial observation. 
Maybe here's a better question. What can the church do better to help parents facilitate that vocation? Oh, I, I would say that well, we, we need to, I, I think, put a lot of emphasis on um, helping parents to be, first and foremost, good disciples, one, and that their primary missionary activities towards their own children of make of you know disciples making disciples to borrow a term and um i i father deacon father uh daniel sorry um i like the term train train it, it, instead of just informing passing information but training so it's not just the the um the the object just it's not the stuff you you learn that's that's giving you know uh, but it's also knowing how to they're giving the tools and 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 also it's it's learning it's for example learning not just what the father said but why they said it at, at that time and to to garner their or to, to gather together uh or to pass on their manner of thinking to deal with the the issues of the day and so forth whether they be dogmatic or whether they be moral and so forth the same thing for for the, i think as the church can do a um a much better job at helping families be families in that regard you know um that's that's brass tap that's that's just the basic the basic things that we really need to do you know so i yeah, think one... so i think also creating a, a a liturgical experience that draws in the youth and 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 emphasizes the primacy of the spiritual life and creates a uh, you know gets them engaged uh i i think those kinds of things you know our churches need to need to and our priests and our deacons need to take responsibility um to to bring joy uh to to the the life of the gospel in the church so i i think that's that's one thing we could certainly do so just speaking on that matter, uh, I've just been working with a young man in my parish. So uh, once a month, starting in September for the whole year, we're starting something called Cinema Divina. Instead of Lexio Divina, we're watching Cinema, we're doing Cinema Divina. So there'll be a, a moment of prayer in the church, then we'll go to the parish center for a movie presentation, and then together as a group, we'll have a time of, of hearing what the Lord where, the, where is the Lord present? What can we learn about him? What can we learn about ourselves as a Christian community and so forth like that? So um, cool. that, that's kind of what, something to teach young adults as they're preparing or just newly married of what they can do with their own children. Mm. Excellent okay. idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's very good. Good. Well, thank you, Father Michael, Father Daniel. Um, all right, we're very quickly moving into the, the final paragraphs of the catechism. Uh, and of course, they are uh, big meaty chunks of uh, church teaching um, and not easy to get through. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to our attendees. I have not forgotten about you. If you do have a question, uh, I know we are a little pressed for time today, a lot to get through. But if you do have a question, uh, do post it and we'll do our best to get to it. And thank you for your attention thus far. So this last uh, portion of the catechism talks about the role of the state. Again, another huge topic in our modern times. But Father Deacon Anthony, um, and again, uh, maybe give me one or two things. Uh, in terms of our Christian understanding of the state, what can we expect from the state? What should we not expect from the state? Again, this is high, high, highly debated right now. Um, and what limits does the state have? I know the catechism talks specifically about capital punishment. So kind of parse out where you feel called to, to answer that question. Sure. Yeah. So the, the fundamental thing that we should expect from the state from a Christian perspective is for it to promote the common good and especially to uphold and defend human life, the value of life. Uh, especially the lives of those who cannot defend themselves. This, for example, relates to what happened in the United States recently with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Uh, I heard people arguing, saying, well, 
you know, the, the state has no business getting involved in this. And my response was, well, the fundamental purpose of the state is to protect those who cannot defend themselves. And there's no one more vulnerable than somebody in the womb or an older person, for example, or somebody who's ill. Uh, the state's fundamental duty is to protect them and to protect and promote, you know, the well-being of all peoples. So what should we expect from the state? We should expect the state to promote the common good and to promote measures which protect people, which respect life, to respect the value of the individual person. What we cannot expect from the state is for the state to solve our, all of our problems. It won't. And we can't expect the state to create the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, sometimes it's tempting for us as Christians to think that if we have complete control of the state, we can make the state God's instrument to transform the world. Ultimately, the world is transformed by God through us, uh, not through the state. The state cannot do that. The state is not the, the leaven. We are the leaven. Um, regarding capital punishment, well, from a Christian Catholic perspective, the biggest problem with it is this. It removes the potential of the human person to achieve theosis. You know, we've talked before about how that's our primary goal, right? To become more and more godlike, to keep um, reaching towards where we're meant to be. When you kill somebody uh, through capital punishment, you take away that potential. You stop them from pursuing that process. So that that is a fundamental problem because ultimately human life is so valuable and the human person is so worthwhile and so dignified that even a corrupted person, even an evil person, still has that right to life. Now, in the past, um, we could justify capital punishment as a means of protecting the innocent, as a means of defending the lives of others. And historically, that was the line the church took. The capital punishment was admissible in situations where it was the only way to protect others. Now, the Catholic teaching on that has evolved a bit uh, since St. John Paul II, because he observed something, that today, with the technology that we have, with the means we have in society, in virtually every case, it is possible to prevent somebody from doing harm if they're properly, you know, contained, right? If you have somebody who's so dangerous, their, their existence is a threat to others, the means exist through technology, you know, through society to prevent them from harming others from inside a prison. And in almost every case, that's probably true. There may be exceptions I'm not aware of, but it's possible, I guess. But in general, I think that holds true, which is why the cap why capital punishment is no longer acceptable in Catholic teaching. Uh, but the other thing to consider is this. What is the purpose of, of punishment? What is the purpose of all of this? In our culture, in Western culture, we often refer to prisons as penitentiaries, right? The root of that is penitent. Um, that's because the purpose of prison, the purpose of punishment is to bring about change, to bring about reform is to prepare a person to live their life in a new way, uh, not to seek revenge. Let's remember that. That's the purpose of this, is not revenge, but to change someone, to bring them to the point of penitence, uh, to conversion. So when you kill them, you take away that possibility as well. Thank you, Father Deacon. Yeah, and, and also another matter that the church needs priests and deacons to minister in prison. Um, you know, I, I know many and deacons who that's that's their apostolate um and it really is it's quite beautiful um because as as much as we want the state to reform those in prison and bring them to the fullness of the gospel um oftentimes that's not their goal um so to have a clergy a member of the clergy there to remind prisoners that that's what your vocation is right now um is so so vitally important and i'm i'm very uh, in awe of our clergy who minister in prison. So thank you, Father Deacon. Uh, Father Michael, um, <clears throat> the Catechism numbers 968 through 970 talks about patriotism, uh, another very, very important topic and something that, again, our culture uh, doesn't always understand. Um, we live in a time where either people are very patriotic uh, to the point of kind of being an extremist, apathetic or indifferent um, that they have no love for their country. So in terms of uh, the catechism, especially there's several very good quotes from Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky in those paragraphs. 
what is the proper Christian understanding of patriotism? Well, we're to be patriotic. You know, that's plain and simple, the fatherland, right? The homeland. Uh, and uh, we as Christians, our, our homeland is first and foremost that of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? That 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 is where uh, to to where we are journeying right now. <clears throat> we do so living within our own societies, our own nations, and so forth. And and we're to to um, be, as uh, often said tonight to be eleven within our societies, within our nations, and so that our nation too can be transfigured. And indeed, this has happened in the past uh, within history of christian nations and so forth right even the united states of america would have been called a christian nation built on christian principles and so forth uh and uh, still 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 those principles still are remain um today although may not be followed <laughs> same in canada and same in many western countries but patriotism is just like we are to love uh, god first right but we still love our family so we, we uh, love God, we love our family, we love uh, the members of our church, and we love our fellow man, woman, and child within our nation. And so to, to that, that expression of love for uh, a nation is, is, is important to be able to express that because that way, again, we can generate um, or we can, be the, we can be the ones whereby God's mercy, his love can come through us. And again, we can be 11 unto others within within society and so it's important to love our nation to be patriotic so but but it's not if you go too extreme right then that's actually um i think it's a an a all synod meeting in the late 19th century in constantinople that called it philatism it's actually declared a heresy whereby uh, I mean, here's an here's an important here's an important thing um the culture carries the gospel to the nations right there's always a cultural expression of the gospel always but when the but but the gospel is the most important right but when it gets reversed then you end up with philatism that the gospel now serves the nation or the language or the ethnicity or the particular culture and so forth and so that's that's always a um <clears throat> excuse me that's always a an, a, a delicate balance that we got to keep within uh, as christians is to keep that delicate balance because there's oftentimes where we want to change the gospel to meet our cultural needs or our nation's needs and so forth but it's uh, ultimately is the gospel the gospel is the truth and it is that which uh, we um, are drawn and by which uh, pushes us uh, to fullness of life and and we can live fully now already begin to live that fullness of life within our particular uh, nation and everything so that's that's pa patriotism is god-given mm. is god-given yeah very good reminder thank you father michael yeah uh, as you were speaking i was being reminded of the the quote from chesterton uh, that right or wrong is like saying my mother drunk or sober great <laughs> quite chester you know it, it puts patriotism in its right light but also he talks a lot about the the love of country that if you love your country you want to see your country change for the best exactly. right so you, you you can't be indifferent um but that healthy love of country well it makes you an active citizen right it makes you a good citizen a citizen who participates in the political life of the nation to bring about that positive change right and the converse is is important not to go into either because if you right. become apathetic you're not being a good christian either exactly yeah exactly yeah. very good it's about that balance great all right we've come to the end of the catechism the last catechism talks about um is the environment um, again, something very, very at large in our, in our present discussions. And um, a, a full point of connection, uh, one of Pope Francis' kind of emphases, and also uh, an emphasis of ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. 
is that care for creation, care for the environment. Now, of course, just like politics, you can take it to the extremes on either end. You can be either a, a super environmentalist um, and, and kind of trample on people, or you can be so apathetic that you don't care what you dump down the sewer. Um, so let's talk. So Father Daniel, um, this goes back to that notion of stewardship, of being a steward over creation. I, I think this is a good way to conclude our walk through the catechism is to read that notion of stewardship in regard to creation. And, and what is that proper Christian understanding of it? Yeah. And, and as you said, you, you know, uh, for instance, with Pope Francis and Laudato Si, uh, you know, this is this was a big focus of his right at the beginning of his pontificate. And I think he properly contextualizes our vocation as human beings in the image and likeness of God as being participants in creation as well as stewards in creation. When we talk about creation, we talk about nature or the environment. We're part of that, <laughs> you know, which means we, we, you know, we can't just dispose of human beings, which is kind of that one extreme uh, where human beings are made the enemy of, of creation. And, and you start to see some of this uh, extremism take shape. And I'm, I've even heard of uh, recently uh, of a priest, you know, talking about, uh, you know, how it, it, we need to reduce the, the surplus population of people as though, you know, people are, are the enemy of the environment or of creation, when in fact, it's, you know, the behavior that's the problem, that's, that's the issue. Um, I go back to creation itself, right? What was the vocation of Adam? Well, first of all, it's noteworthy that God formed man from the dust of the earth and then breathed into him his breath, giving, making him a living soul, making him a living being. Um, we are drawn from the earth uh, like a tree. <laughs> uh, the, the image of the, of the two trees is, is, is a very apt image to describe sort of the two paths that humanity, humanity can take, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're like a tree drawn out from uh, and with our roots in the earth, and yet at the same time reaching up to uh, to heaven, uh, because we are also a spiritual soul, and uh, we are a, a, a body soul uh, unity, and uh, and and that's part of our priestly dignity that we can, you know, God condescends to give us the gift of creation. We offer creation back to God. Uh, this is what worship, you know, katabasis anabasis. You know, God condescends to give anabasis. We elevate it and, and offer it back to God. That's our priestly dignity fr from creation itself. So we're drawn from the earth. The earth truly is, to borrow Franciscan, classically Franciscan references, which Pope Francis does, you know, Mother Earth. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean Gaia worship or whatever it is. It just means that, you know, we have a relationship now with, with the earth based upon what was revealed uh, in, in Genesis. At the same time, this vocation that comes to us is to exercise responsible dominion, not domination, but dominion. Uh, and stewardship. And so what was the original vocation of Adam? Adam and Eve, they were called to exercise dominion over creation and to be fruitful and multiply, which means that humanity is not the enemy of dominion or the, the enemy of proper stewardship. It is the means by which proper stewardship is exercised. In fact, if we see Eden sort of existing on the mountain of God, the uh, the vocation of humanity was to extend was uh, was to extend Eden to the rest of the world was was to be the images of God spreading out and you know creating altars offering to God the good things of of creation uh, being a steward you know Adam's first vocation was to be a gardener uh, for goodness sake we can we can say this is this is a an environmental calling an environmentally friendly calling to be a, to be a gardener. I think about it in the church today, I, and I've been sharing this a little bit with some of my faithful, you know, what we want to do when it comes to looking at our little church and the altar, the holy table, it should be a source of not only um, of, of establishing the dominion of the kingdom of God, but a source of transformation of the whole property, where the whole property is made into sort of this Edenic image of life in the presence of God, 
and to that to be reflected in the beauty, the diversity, the biodiversity, whatever word you want to use of, of creation itself. And so what I think Pope Francis did, and I think he did quite well, is to situate ourselves in the context of God's creation and creation, laudato si, you know, being offering praise to God. And uh, that comes through humanity. And that means we need to be stewards. We need to respect beauty. We need to, you know, respect uh, and, and conserve the environment and, and use our resources well. Understanding the, the primacy of the human person, um, but seeing that, that primacy in the context of his total vocation as a, as a steward. So that would be what I would say. And I think it's, I think it's borne out, especially in, uh, in the catechism. And, and, it, and it shows you know, that, that sort of vision, that integral vision of what we're called to be as, as human beings. Very good. Thank you, Father Daniel. Yeah, good, good summary, good summary. And um, gosh, that, that takes us through it all. The entire catechism, Christ our Pascha. There we go. Um, wow. Yeah, what a ride. This, <laughs> is, this has been great. Um, from cover to cover. So I, I wanted, we've got about six minutes left. Um, I wanted to just get our panelists like in, in, in one, one sentence or two. Um, just your general thoughts on this walk through Christ our Pascha. I know for me, it was my, my first time really to, to look at the text and uh, I fell in love with it. It's just so rich in our, in our Eastern tradition. I, I really loved going through it. So, so Father Dan, thoughts? Uh, my thought was it was, it, it shows that the, the wealth of the catechism is really uncovered through dialogue and discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, I've appreciated all the insights of my fellow panelists here, uh, and as well as feedback from, uh, from those that participate. And I, and I think the catechism is a gift to the church um, and I, I hope we continue to unpack it even after uh, this experience. Father Deacon Anthony? Yeah, my, my experience is similar. Um, I've always loved Christor Pascha, but I never really thought about it in at the same level as we did through this um, program. And it made me appreciate how much, how far it goes really in, in showing that traditional, truly Eastern theology and Catholic theology are fully compatible. Mm. That's something I've always argued that Catholicism and true Eastern theology are not in opposition opposition to one another. They're compatible, and uh, I have a greater appreciation for that for going through this program with you guys. Beautiful, beautiful, Father Michael. Well, uh, having spent a lot of time with this text <laughs> in uh, in various uh, forms and so forth. Um, it's nice to see it kind of being fleshed out uh, mm. in the life of the church, rather than just a, a tome on a shelf somewhere. Mm. The catechism does no good on a shelf. Um, it should get, <coughs> excuse me, uh, dog-eared and tagged and underlined. And um, I realize I should have made larger margins and and so forth so that people can ask their questions and 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 this and I, I i don't know which one of the two you just said it but that um that talking about it the dialogue about it that this is what this is what the catechism is for mm -hmm. <laughs> very much <laughs> like in in, in an out and and an as wave by way of analogy how the gospel while we honor the gospel book as it's carried in procession and so forth it's when the gospel is proclaimed mm -hmm. that that that's when it rings. Mm -hmm. That's that's the gospel in its beauty. What is proclaimed, you know, uh, how lovely on the mountains, mm -hmm. you know, are the feet of the one who brings good news. I'm, I'm that's a paraphrase, right, from Isaiah, and um, and, and I just imagine that every time at the liturgy, and then we receive it, we hear it, and then. We sit and we talk about it. So the catechism is like taking all of the gospel and having it proclaimed and sitting down and having a homily mm -hmm. and having a dialogue about it. You know, so that, that that's um, kind of a, it's a liturgical act out, 
which is extended from the divine liturgy i think mm. yeah wonderful beautiful all right as we come to the end of our time father daniel the last word is with you uh let us please tell us what is next for our becoming byzantine series what's coming up in the future well, it's I'm very excited and I have many things I could share, but the one thing I want to share is that we're going to be uh, taking a lot all this content that we've created over the past year uh, in partnership uh, with each other and, and in partnership with the Sheptitsky Institute. Uh, and we are going to be creating a learning platform uh, that really helps to bring it to life even further through self-directed learning and through group learning. Um, and so uh, we have a, a plan to have an interim website set up. Uh, and uh, with that website, uh, we'll be able to host all the videos and she'll have easy access to the videos. But then by the end of this year, we will have a, a more interactive learning experience that we'll be able to share with all of you. And, and we'll really look forward to uh, sending out information and promoting it uh, with all of you for free. All of it will be for free. So. I, I'm, I'm very excited about what we're going to be doing, and, and hopefully this is a resource that gets used for many, many years to come. That is awesome news. Awesome mm -hmm. news. And of course, that is all thanks to our attendees, those who have been with us from day one. Um, thank you so much for being with us. To our sponsors, Vineyard of the Lord, the Eparchy of Phoenix, Sheptitsky Institute. Um, it's been incredible how much this has grown uh it's been such a wonderful wonderful blessing so father daniel as we conclude would you lead us in prayer yes i'll do that i was just responding to a question <laughs> may almighty god he who is the source of our life he who has given us the grace of the knowledge of the truth and the love of our communion with him and with each other in the church may he bless us and keep us and transfigure us in the mm. light of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, thank you all very much again for journeying with us. It's been great. Father Daniel, Father Deacon Anthony, Father Michael. Um, it's been a great honor and grace to me personally. So thank you all very much. And uh, we'll bring this series to a close. And until we meet again, uh, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. forever. Mm.